Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Nikhil Kamath to Salt Talks. Nikhil is the co-founder and chief investment officer of both ZeroDA, which is the largest uh, bro brokerage exchange in India. It's been called the Robin Hood of India, as well as True Beacon, an asset management firm uh, that Nikhil and his brother started, uh, that, that they saw an opportunity to disrupt the traditional asset management space in India and around the world. And I know their performance has been fantastic since they started True Beacon as well. But Nikhil uh, also has a non-traditional background into, into the business world. Uh, he started trading equities at the age of 17 after giving up a career as a uh, professional chess player. He was a chess prodigy, dropped out of school at a young age, but started trading stocks and fell in love uh, with financial markets. Uh, he largely focused when he was a trader on emerging derivatives and commodity sectors before co-founding Kamath Associates at the age of 19 to manage the net worth uh, of high net worth individuals in portfolios and public markets. And in 2010, as I mentioned, at the age of 23, he co-founded ZeroDA with his brother, Nitin. Uh, the company aimed to revolutionize Indian financial market access by adopting a transparent, ultra low fee and proprietary tech driven strategy. It's also self-funded uh, by the Kamath brothers, so it's taken no venture capital funding. It has over 3 million users and is the country's largest retail brokerage platform. It facilitates orders worth 10 billion US dollars per day, which accounts for about 15% of the daily equity volume in India. The company's headquartered in Asia's IT hub, Bangalore, and as I mentioned, is funded entirely by Nikhil and Nitin, and has a valuation of over 2 billion US dollars. Uh, the, the Kamath brothers also incubate uh, fintech companies through their VC fund, Rain Matter, aggressively investing in a variety of different fintech companies, driving innovation aimed at bringing financial inclusion across India, which is something uh, that is a very welcome development. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. Skybridge traditionally is, is in the hedge fund industry as a fund of funds, but in recent years, we've continued to diversify our business have made several investments into the fintech sector. So looking forward to a great conversation today about fintech, about trading, about financial markets. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Well, first of all, congratulations on your amazing career. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're super thrilled to have you, but I wanna go back uh, because you're 17, you're trading, um, you're being inspired somewhere to start so early. Um, and so tell us about that. Where, where did you get your vision from, your inspiration? And when did you decide that this is what you were going to do with your life? So, Anthony, there never really has been a plan. Uh, I think uh, everything that has happened up until now has been fairly organic. Uh, the decision to go into trading happened by virtue of having people in my vicinity, my peer group, some people I knew who were trading back in the day. Uh, I attempted many different things at that point in life, but uh, trading is the one thing that kind of stuck on. I think it worked well for me. And also I had some kind of a natural liking towards trading. Uh, the one great thing about trading, a career in trading or investing when you're going solo and not working for a larger enterprise, is there's no starting, uh, you know, minimum qualification one requires, or uh, you don't need to pass a certain exam to be able to do it. You can, you know, bring in a little bit of capital and you can begin trading on your own. So that played a huge part in uh, the entire trading career. You, you're, you're the founder of India's largest retail brokerage company, Zero Dow. So tell us about the origination of that company uh, and why you've got competitors. Uh, what was your edge uh, mm -hmm. in terms of your execution and your vision for the company? So when we started 11 years ago, uh, the marketplace then was very expensive. 
brokers would charge as much as half a percent on volume as a broking fee. Uh, back when we were full-time traders, uh, we, we always thought that it would be impossible uh, to remain efficient and profitable as a trader paying these kind of fees. So the intention of starting a broking firm was to kind of like rid ourselves out of paying those fees. Uh, but once we started, we got a broking platform and we started using it and kind of start developing it the very early stages, people really liked it and they came on board. So we've been in the very lucky uh, situation where we A started in 2009 right after the financial crisis. So not much money was going into innovating uh, the fintech industry, especially in India. But B, also to have organically grown without having to, you know, go out there and market or do ads and stuff like that. You, 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 you've you, said, I mean, I have heard you say this, that uh, there are people that have inspired you. So tell us about those people. Tell us who your mentors are. Tell us who you lean on. Who's your personal board of directors? Well, mentors, uh, mentorship is not something I truly believe in, especially I think uh, you start off in life having a mentor and then when you meet them physically and uh, you spend a little bit of time in, with them, everybody has flaws. So the whole mentor-mentee relationship I don't think works. But uh, as my personal board of directors, you know, it would be my brother, some of my colleagues who, who have been working with us for a long time now, I would consider them the personal board. You know, it's interesting, you know, uh, uh, Churchill said that once, he said that there are no heroes to a man's valet. And at the end of the day, mm -hmm. that uh, no matter who we're talking about, they've got uh, issues, strengths and weaknesses, et cetera. And I, and I t totally agree with that. Tell us about the asset management company called True Beacon. Um, why did you take that step? And tell us what True Beacon is. Yeah, so even today, I mean, if you were to look at different geographies, not just in India, but even in America, for example, uh, when an ultra h and individual uh, typically wants to allocate money to a third party fund, he goes to his wealth manager or private bank who acts as a middleman in introducing the fund and they charge you a percent or two in between to set up the fund for you. Then the fund manager charges you 2% a year if the client makes money, does not make money. There is a recurring fee of 2%, which is essentially paid in perpetuity. Uh, and there are many inefficiencies like, you know, these are not open-ended. Uh, there are lock-in periods. You can't take out your money for three years and such. So the intention of starting True Beacon was, you know, uh, when I wanted to allocate my personal money a few years ago, these are the issues I dealt with. And uh, I was like, if there is not a great product for something like this, why not try and attempt to create it on our own? So we are trying to rid the ecosystem of all of the inefficiencies that I just mentioned. Uh, True Beacon will not have any middlemen, not have any distributors. Uh, no setup fees, no exit loads, no lock-in, uh, completely open-ended. We don't have the typical annual management fee that other fund houses do. Uh, instead, we've kind of like got a performance fee of 10%, which makes us totally client aligned. Uh, it's a way of putting the fund manager's neck on the line. So if we don't make money for the clients for any reason, for three years or four years, we have zero revenue as a company. So we're trying to approach asset management in in a slightly different manner, uh, wherein, you know, we only bill based on the performance we bring in and we have kind of waved off everything else. You, you know, it, it, it's fascinating. And you, and you got your start basically at 14. I mean, you dropped out of school at 14. You became a chess champion. Um, tell us about the future um, I have adult children, uh, two of which went to college, one went to business school, one, uh, one has dropped out of college, uh, and he's pursuing a career in the uh, music industry. And, you know, right. he's doing quite well without his college degree, as he points out to me all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an old fashioned fuddy duddy. I went to college, I went to law school. Uh, but the future is really different, Nikhil, and the mm -hmm. things have changed. So tell older people, your observation of that, and where is the future as it relates to secondary education? 
Yeah, I think education, the formal structured education, I think has to change to keep keep uh, keep pace with the, how the times are changing. But one significant change that I think will happen is people will no longer have one career in which they spend 40 years. I think the newer generation is a lot less patient than the previous ones were. So I would picture, you know, having people having three or four careers in their lifespan. You know, somebody does a certain kind of job for 10 years, takes a year off and then does completely uh, something which is very different for the next 10 and so on and so forth. So I think the gig economy is going to play a bigger part than we have witnessed up until now. Uh, and education, I think, will change in a manner that outside of what you learn in your college or your school or whatever whatever stream of education you choose to pursue versus the amount of information and knowledge you're able to you know, assimilate on your own. And practical, pragmatic knowledge will probably have uh, greater importance than traditional structured uh, education. So I shouldn't worry about my kid. Is that what you're telling me? I mean, I, you know, because I, I, I'm I'm this old fashioned traditionalist, Nikhil. Well, I, I wouldn't know, Anthony, but uh, I'm guessing. Uh, I think we used to evolve at a pace, you know, like uh, a 40 year old man would meet a 20 year old kid back in the day and and realize that the 20 year old is far more evolved, smarter in many ways than the 40 year old is. I think that intergenerational gap, that window is narrowing. Now, if I meet somebody who is five years younger than me instead of 20, you already see the difference. They're a bit more evolved, a bit more uh, technologically uh, adept in a way. And uh, I think that that pace of evolution is changing significantly. So just by virtue of him being your son and so much younger than you, I think the probability that he's also a bit more evolved are quite high. You know, it's 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 it's, it's interesting because I, I, I absolutely believe that. Of course, I supported his uh, departure from school and he's, he's doing something he really loves. I, I live by the motto of Mel Brooks, the American comedian, uh, where he says, relax, none of us are getting out of here alive. And so you have to pursue your dreams and, 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 and have that vision. And I think what you're saying is a resonating message for people of all generations. We can learn from each other. We're also coming into the earth with different uh, families. We're coming into the earth with different uh, biology. And so therefore, you know, you know, some of us are more advanced than others. I can remember uh, Michael Dell, who helped me actually get Skybridge started, when he was 27 or 28, I said to him, I've done everything right. I went to law school. I went to uh, undergrad. You dropped out, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we're separated now by billions of dollars. And so I, I always want to encourage people to pursue their dreams and to stay on stuff like this. So you're, you're a great role model for these young kids. Um, before I switch over to GameStop and things like that, what advice do you give people? Um, people call on you and they say, okay, this is what I'm thinking about with my career. What is sort of the template that you tell people to think about philosophically? Well, I th there is no template. I, I would say that, but uh, uh, I think we've all been too fixated by our peer groups in a way. Uh, the people, the cities that we grew up in, the people that we grew up with, uh, there is this French guy, René Girard, who talks about something called mimetic theory. Uh, in isolation, we truly do not know what we want. Uh, we think we want what we want based on the people around us by, you know, kind of mimicking uh, what their perceived goals are. So I would say, you know, like take the time to figure out what you actually want. Uh, having more money might make a certain pedigree of people happy or having more uh, academic success might make a certain kind of people happy, but your version of happiness, I don't think can have a template or your version of, you know, feeling fulfilled in life, you will have to figure out on your own. Uh, as time passes, I, I think I'm coming to realize that the whole monetary aspect of uh, trying to have more wealth than your peer group, uh, it doesn't appeal to the newer generation as it did to, you know, maybe my generation or yours. When you meet a 15 or a 20 year old uh, a kid today, 
especially in the affluent community, I don't think their trip in life is to have more than their friends in terms of financial value. A lot of them are evolving to, you know, uh, in a way, be a bit more righteous and kind of like do things which are uh, not just good for them, but for the ecology and the community as well, which is actually uh, very, you know, interesting and inspiring. And I hope the world evolves in that direction. Listen, I think I think it's a beautiful statement. It's the reason why I wanted to ask you about this because, you know, we're finding now that we are, and, and again, we have social issues related to this because we're not spreading the wealth as much as we need to. And of course, I want to do that through market forces, not through the imposition of the government. But as we get more abundance in the world, we find that our base needs are fulfilled. And so therefore, what are we actualizing as human beings? And so with that, what is the next step for you as you see your career unfolding? I think more of the same. Uh, the one thing I've realized, Anthony, is each time I attempt something which is not my core competency, uh, I'm guessing my core competency is, you know, stock markets and fintech. Uh, every time I've invested outside of that, I've tried to be adventurous and do new things. They've never really worked out for me. So I think I'm going to stick to my niche and kind of like try to build more product and more companies, but in my core sector. And uh, we've started asset management now. Uh, we might attempt insurance, banking, but everything in, in the sector where we already have a captive audience. Yeah, I think it's good advice. I mean, of course, I had my foray in politics, Nikhil. And, and, um, I know. Yeah, that didn't yeah. That, that that wasn't my sweet spot. You can see John Darcy laughing. I'm going to cut his <laughs> mic later, okay? Because I see him yeah. giggling to himself over there. Uh, before I, I turn it over, you, what's I that? I don't know if you remember Anthony. We spoke about this. Uh, we met at, Dav at Davos in a pre-pandemic world last year, and I remember you talking about politics, and I think Trump was meant to be speaking there and stuff like that. Very yes, interesting. No, we were. I know. I totally remember. We were at the wine party. <laughs> Uh, yeah. it, was, it was interesting that, uh, you know, we, we had, of course, Trump and I had, had a falling out. Uh, I tried to be supportive of him. Um, but uh, I don't know if you remember, but standing with us was Mark Burnett, uh, yeah. the producer of the uh, of the show, The Apprentice. Yeah. And so yeah. Mark, Mark wanted me to uh, smoke a peace pipe with uh, <laughs> President Trump. But, uh, you know, obviously that didn't come to pass. But in any event, yeah, no, I, I absolutely remember the conversation vividly. Um, before I turn it over to John Dorsey, who is our resident millennial that has all of the fancy pants millennial questions, I'm more of the boomer, old fashioned questioner. Uh, but before I turn it over to him, you're an avid reader. Uh, that's something I uh, uh, pride myself in. I try to read everything. And so what types of books do you like? What's on your nightstand right now? Uh, what do you what do you what do you what are you reading these days? Yeah, so I, I try to keep it fairly eclectic. I had a big history phase where I was very interested in, you know, uh, Greek history, uh, maybe the Nazi history, many different bouts of history. Uh, that was followed up by psychology. I think that interests me today more than other things because at the end what's of the a, day... What's a good psychology book, Nikhil, that you've read recently? Uh, what I was talking about earlier, it's in between philosophy and psychology, but uh, the mimetic theories of René Girard, I think, are a good book. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Freud is a little bit out there, but a euphemized version would probably be Jung, which is more apt for readers today. Uh, Adler is good. Uh, I mean, many, many great books in psychology, but if I have to talk about one book I like right now, I think it's Rennie's. Okay, good. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to John, but before I do that, talk to me about GameStop and the yeah. emblematic nature of GameStop. Is there a revolution going on right now? Is this a blip on the screen, or are we going to see a revolution because of people like you? Um, you're basically providing technology to people that I saw back in 1995 on the Goldman Sachs prop desk. Uh, where you're getting instant information and instant feed, relatively costless or almost costless trading. Uh, those are things that uh, gave the Goldman Sachs prop trader 25 years ago a significant advantage. You're evening the playing field for people. 
So is this a game changer or a blip in the system? Well, I, I think the it's a pity that, you know, these guys who are the Reddit traders picked something like GameStop, uh, which inherently does not have sound fundamentals. Uh, it was a company walking towards bankruptcy before they started meddling with it anyway. On the other hand, if they were to pick a company which a hedge fund had shorted and beat down, which had decent fundamentals and had had scope and potential to grow, I think the equation would be totally different. Uh, in this entire GameStop saga, I think those Reddit traders, they are the ones who actually ended up losing a lot of money. Uh, so I would say blip. I don't think this will continue, but uh, information about hedge funds being short whatever company is publicly available and has been so for a long time. Uh, great if people want to you know, champion the cause of the company and support the small guy and get together and all of that, but they should pick companies with some kind of fundamentals versus picking companies which are on the verge of bankruptcy and moving the price only based on you know the fact that they can come together with a certain amount of capital. I don't think that works. John Dorsey. All right. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, Nikhil. Um, I want to talk about India for a second. So you guys are based in Bangalore. Uh, we recently had Rahul Pajitapati on on Assault Talk, talking about uh, things that are going on in the digital asset space in just India. Just so but, you know, he's been practicing pronouncing that name for about six <laughs> months. Okay. I just want to make sure you know that. Okay. It was very Thank good, John. Okay, I was impressed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anthony still can't pronounce Chamath Palihapitiya, but uh, <laughs> for some reason I've, I've got them all but down. Chamath happens to like me despite the fact that I can't pronounce his name. Okay. That's fair. Uh, I guess that's why everybody just calls him Chamath. But India is a fascinating place to me. It's it's somewhere that's rapidly uh, modernizing. It has an incredible base of engineering talent and entrepreneurs. Uh, in your time as an investor as an, and an entrepreneur over the last decade or so, how has the entrepreneurial landscape evolved in India? How has the quality of investment opportunities in India evolved? And what do you see as the future for India as you look out over the next decade? Yeah, so the one thing that has changed over the last decade is uh, a lot more attention has fallen upon, you know, Indian entrepreneurs and the startup scene here. Uh, just in terms of liquidity and the amount of money chasing quality Indian startups, I think the number has gone up 20 fold in the last decade. I think that trend will continue. Uh, we have to remember that, you know, India is a large country, right? We have, uh, we have a lot of people. When it comes to things like fintech companies or people like us who are stock brokers, we're operating in an ecosystem wherein, for example, out of the billion and a half people we have in the country, only about one or two percent of our population, even today, has access to financial markets. So that number will steadily continue to grow and, you know, it will go up and at some point it will come near the 60, 50 percent that you might have in America. So each micro market like that in India, each ecosystem has significant scale and potential to grow. And I think people recognize that opportunity and there has been a lot more attention, capital, interest in India. Uh, in the very short term, though, I think it's a bit overdone. I think uh, uh, how we are valuing startups in India today just because of this, you know, the cycle where we will grow from being this small ecosystem to a much larger one over the next 10 or 20 years, I don't think even uh, accounting for that, the valuations we see are justified. Uh, if you were to look at the 10 most valued startups in India, uh, maybe nine of them do not have any profits. Uh, and I don't think that's a fair picture. And I don't think that's a good way to kind of like... Uh, value them. There's no justification for that. So it'll be interesting to see how that changes and evolves. Well, I'm sure your investors uh, value the fact that you tell them the truth. You know, you have a lot of cheerleaders in financial markets today. It's it's, uh, it's good to hear a sober and honest assessment of, of what's going on. But I want to go back to uh, your sort of adolescence. You were, you were a chess champion. You didn't, you know, maybe weren't able to take the next step into being the greatest grandmaster in the world or a professional chess player, but you were an extremely talented chess player. A lot of people I know that are very successful, young entrepreneurs play chess and are very good at it. 
Are there things that you learn or, or skills or mental frameworks that you learn in chess that you think that you've been able to apply in business to help you be successful? A little bit, maybe. Uh, so, John, I think chess is more about uh, memory and theory than it is about intelligence and, you know, how smart who is. You become a better chess player, you know, when you have gone through middle game theory, end game theory. Uh, you have kind of like read up on all the games that have been played historically. And in a way, you're able to regurgitate what has happened and who did what when during your chess game. Uh, the one parallel maybe that I could draw is chess is a bunch of rules that you have to follow. You know, you, you try and control the center, you develop your pieces, you castle as quickly as you can. Uh, beyond these rules, there is opportunity to be creative and differentiate yourself as a player. I think that applies in business. Uh, it, it might be a business run by a millennial, a baby boomer, or, you know, a generation Z or whatever. But I think there are these rules that each one of us has to follow in the business that we are attempting. And we get to be creative beyond that and differentiate beyond that. I think that's a good parallel and maybe chess teaches you to do that a little bit better. Right. So I think fintech is a good application of that. So obviously the financial industry uh, in, in different countries, there's different regulatory frameworks, but you have to fit within certain regulatory frameworks as a financial entity. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of investors, especially venture capital investors, like to invest in people that are disrupting the financial industry that don't necessarily come from inside the establishment. So people that can look at it with a fresh set of eyes and say, you know, maybe things are done this way and they could be done this way. But obviously, it all has to fit inside of a regulatory framework. What type of fintech companies are you most excited about that maybe take a fresh look at the way things have been done historically? There's obviously a lot taking place in the fintech sector, we're investors in companies like Klarna, which is the largest player in the buy now, pay later space. Uh, Plaid is a um, is another fintech company that's enabling these pipes and rails, you know, into traditional banks through fintech fintech applications. Chime is another one that's a neo bank that's basically disrupting the entire you know branch banking model. What different types of fintechs are you most excited about, and do you think are changing the system, you know, most actively? I think there is a big opportunity to disrupt banking. Uh, I think the whole lending, almost everything a bank does today has not seen serious disruption in a long time. Sure, there have been, met, you know, like uh, neo banks in different pockets of the world, which have done well. But structurally, banking has not changed. And that carry in between how much a bank borrows at, how much they lend at, uh, I think there's plenty of room to disrupt there. I think banking, uh, in a way, will move towards becoming more fragmented than consolidating. And you will have tinier banks in different niches, which do a better job at serving the clientele in those niches versus having one large bank, which does everything. Uh, so in fintech, I've seen a lot of evolution in asset management and broking in uh, uh, even to a large extent in insurance and products related to that. But I think banking will be the next big sector to be uh, disrupted. Right. And and how has the pandemic not just impacted your business there at Zero Dow or the way you invest at True Beacon, but in the way you think about the world? So, you know, obviously, uh, there's a couple different factors at play. We moved to a completely digital world almost. We're sitting here talking on Zoom rather than being at an in-person conference or you visiting our office here in New York, uh, in the United States and around the world, different central banks and governments threw money at the problem. So yeah. when you look at the long-term impacts of the pandemic, how has it reshaped your business and, and helped it grow? What do you think are gonna be the long-term impacts of the way our minds were sort of reshaped uh, by the pandemic era? Yeah, so for business, it has been good, uh, I think. Uh, people who did not have time to, you know, go out there, open a trading account and allocate some time to invest have actually gotten the time now. So the industry has grown tremendously and we have grown with it. Uh, I think the same has happened in America as well, where a lot more investors and traders have kind of manifested out during the pandemic. Uh, personally, I, I quite hate it, John. I mean, I'm sick of like talking to people on a computer <laughs> screen and 
Zoom is great and everything, but you know, beyond a point, it does get. Uh, I don't think it's the same as meeting someone in person. Uh, so, honestly, I can't wait for it to end. Uh, I'd love to begin, you know, life where I get to travel and meet people and do things together and collaborate. Uh, this entire sitting in, you know, your home office and staring at a Zoom screen all day. I think I'm I'm kind of like completely bored out of doing that. Well, that gives me a good segue to plug our Salt Conference, which we're resuming uh, in September of 2021 in New York City. Uh, to the extent you're able to travel safely, we'd love to have you there uh, September 13th to the 15th in New York City. It's going to be the first time that we've held our conference in New York City. You know, we were trying to help the city sort of bounce back from the pandemic and also make it accessible to people like you who might be traveling in from out of town. We also most recently did our SALT conference in Abu Dhabi in 2019. Uh, so we're looking forward to welcoming people from the UAE over to our SALT conference in New York. But we'd love to have you there. And, and we're believers in the exact same thing, that you can't replace that interpersonal interaction uh, when it comes to evaluating people uh, and, and making connections. And I also love that you're not talking your book again. I know the pandemic has probably been very good for your business, the same way it's been good for a lot of uh, fintech-oriented companies. Um, but I want to talk about crypto and blockchain technology for a second. So you're not necessarily directly in that space. I don't know, you potentially incubate some companies in that space through Rain Matter. Uh, but you obviously seen an explosion in the prices of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others, an explosion in things like non-fungible tokens and decentralized finance. What's your view on crypto and blockchain? Uh, how has it reshaped the way you think about business or fintech? Or, or are you thinking that this is some sort of uh, short-term fad that's going to wane? Yeah, so John, I, I am fairly jaded by the fact that I missed the bus and I don't own any Bitcoins or I don't have any large crypto investments. Uh, I think central banks across the world, uh, especially America for that, in that case, has been fairly irresponsible over the last two or three decades. I think uh, they have continued to print money uh, at a rate that that should ideally have the rest of the world question what is happening. But considering that, you know, uh, it's not in our best interest to do that. And we all also in turn own uh, many dollar backed assets. It does not happen. So I think the use case for something like a Bitcoin, which has a finite number that is available, are increasing. But I think the question then is at $60,000 a coin, uh, uh, do I think I have missed the bus and I would not like to chase the rally anymore? Yeah, I would say uh, at $60,000 a coin, I don't think I'm in that boat which believes that, you know, Bitcoins will have the same market capitalizations as gold in a way. They're comparing it to things. Uh, it's like, a, you know, apples to tomatoes kind of a comparison. They have nothing in common. At the end of the day, gold still has a use case and uh, there is a cost of mining each time you get gold out. So I'm not the biggest fan of crypto coins or bitcoins. I think uh, the, the technology definitely has a use case, but the anonymity it kind of delivers to people who are using it, I think will cause trouble at different points of time which will in turn act as a big hindrance on this becoming uh, a more widely accepted currency. Yeah, I mean, we've talked to some of the, the smartest money managers in the world who have a similar uh, point of view on Bitcoin, where they now embrace the story. They understand why uh, it has rallied in, in the midst of historic money printing and, uh, and money creation in the midst of us moving to a fully digital world for a year, year and a half. They fully get it, but uh, you know there's some some ego that that comes in when they don't want to be the one holding the bag and chasing uh, Bitcoin around this sixty thousand uh, dollar area. But we try to impress on on people our belief that it's still very early uh, for Bitcoin and and this entire movement. But I want to talk about access to financial markets. And Anthony talked about GameStop for a moment. Um, in general, I think there are differing views on Robinhood, as you mentioned. A lot of the retail investors that invested in GameStop lost their shirt. You know, they they uh, thought that this was some type of game. The Robinhood has definitely gamified uh, people's participation in financial markets and given people access that didn't have it before. On one hand, that's very positive that you have more people that are participating potentially in you know asset inflation and, and able to invest in companies even with small dollar amounts. 
But at the same time, that gamification has also lured people into a game that is very difficult and psychologically challenging. Do you think it's a double-edged sword when it comes to increased access to financial markets through things like Robinhood or Zerodia? Uh, or do you think it's, it's just overwhelmingly positive to have more people participating uh, in that system? Personally, I'm kind of a fan of free market. I think we should have uh, as much access as possible. But what we need to be careful of is, you know, the amount of leverage that is provided, and stuff like that. I think that's where the regulators need to step in. Sure, it is okay for people to buy GameStop. It's okay for people to short GameStop. But when you allow for someone with $1 to short $50 worth of GameStop by virtue of leverage, I think that's when things get uh, a bit unnatural. Maybe to cap, you know, the net short that can be available on a certain company to the market cap of that company is probably a fair thing to do. Uh, many regulators have done a great job. Some have not. Uh, I don't think in America, the regulators have done a great job. On the other hand, in India, some countries in Southeast Asia have been uh, a bit more proactive and kind of like uh, mitigated risks before large events occurred. But I'm sure, uh, you know, the SEV or the American regulators are going to turn around and make it harder for these these scenarios to occur in the future. Well, Nikhil, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Again, just to reiterate, we couldn't agree more with you about uh, interpersonal interactions. So we're looking forward to next time we see you not be on Zoom, but either at, at the wine party in Davos or potentially at our SALT conference in September. Uh, we would like nothing more. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Anthony. Lovely catching up again. Yeah, it's a, pl- it's a pleasure to have you on with us. I'm looking forward to seeing you live. And I promise you very good wine the next time yeah. we get together. Definitely. Looking forward to that. Thank Be you, well. guys. Be well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you again, Nikhil. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's Salt Talk uh, with N- Nikhil Kamath, who is the co-founder with his brother, Nitin, of both Zero Da, the leading a brokerage platform in India, as well as True Beacon, uh, one of the top emerging asset managers in India, as well as incubating uh, tons of exciting fintech companies. Just a reminder, uh, if you miss any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT talks, you can access them all on our website at salt.org backslash talks and on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. We're all on social media on all the different platforms. We're most active on Twitter, though, at Salt Conference. We'd love for you to follow us there. Uh, but also on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Instagram as well. And please spread the word about these Salt Talks. Uh, We love meeting uh, new people, introducing uh, our audience to new people like Nikhil, who are young people doing exciting things uh, in the world of finance and technology. But on behalf of Anthony and the entire Salt team, this is John Darcy signing off from Salt Talks for today. We hope to see you back here soon.